This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Josh Strickland, and I just want, uh, before we start with anything else, happy Cinco de Mayo. It is May 5th. Uh, I know you're probably not doing anything special today, but, uh, you know, Cinco de Mayo. Uh, so if you like the podcast, please like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast, of course. And uh, we have a show here today where we're going to start with South Korean baseball and then we're going to move on to a pair of NFL quarterbacks with Andy Dalton and Mitchell Trubisky then we're going to go to the NHL draft in June then we'll talk about college football could we be heading into a college football season without some schools without with some schools without some schools then we'll talk about the last dance recap of episodes five and six from Sunday night but first let's talk about South Korean baseball which this is a brand new like this ha- this just happened so um, I'm filming this Tuesday morning so South Korean baseball actually had their opening day uh, at one o'clock in the morning this morning um, so ESPN announced yesterday at 11 that they will televise at least one game per day at 1 o'clock in the morning. And yes, there were people that stayed up. I was not one of those people. But there were people that stayed up to watch South Korean baseball last night because we are so starved for sports just in general. We're starved. Baseball fans are definitely starved because they just got from an offseason. They they were so close. They were so close to tasting baseball but uh now we have south korean baseball i've talked about taiwanese baseball before but south korean baseball is a little bit bigger than taiwanese baseball uh, if, you, if you if you think about it it's, uh, you have america the mlb then you have japan and then you have south korea pretty much as third in the uh world the kbo the korea baseball organization is uh one of the biggest baseball organizations in the world baseball leagues um it has more than five teams whereas taiwanese baseball team has uh five but anyways uh so espn will televise south korea's korea baseball organization games during the upcoming 2020 season starting with the league's opening day which was this morning at 1 a.m so they will become kbo's exclusive english language home as part of an agreement with eclat Media Group announced Monday, and it will televise six regular season games per week. Um, Burke Magnus, ESPN's executive vice president of programming, said we're thrilled to become the exclusive English language home of the KBO League and to showcase its compelling action and high-level competition. We have a long-standing history of documenting the game of baseball, and we're excited to deliver these live events to sports fans because that's the only thing on. Uh, the season opening game was between the NC Dinos and the Samsung Lions, which I can look up the box score real quick, and we can talk about that a little bit. And I'll also go through uh, the the teams in the league uh, here in a little bit, just so we can can do a little crash course of the KBO here real quick. Um, So... So the NC Dinos beat the Samsung Lions 4-0 last night. Um, So... Good for them. I don't really, I don't see any stats. Uh, you would think ESPN would have stats on that, but let's look at the teams. Let, let, let's, let's do a rundown of the teams. Um, so we have, we have 10 teams in the Korean baseball organization. You have the Deuce and Bears established in 1982. They're in Seoul or Seoul, one of the two. They have six championships. Their manager is Kim Tae Young. Um, they also have contact information. They have their number on here. So there you go. Uh, Key Womb Heroes, established 2008. They're also from Seoul. They uh, have zero championships. Manager of Sun Yuk. Um, the SK Wyverns, I think. Yeah, the SK Wyverns. 
They were established in the year 2000. They are in Incheon. I think that's how you say that. Four championships. Yoon Young Yub is their manager. The LJ tw- the LG Twins and yes, LG as in the uh the phone manufacturer uh cuz it's the same as uh Taiwanese baseball. They they're not named after the city they play in. They are named after the, a corporation. Uh, a company, so uh, it's it's an it's it's a thing over there. Uh, so the LG Twins, they're also in Seoul. They were founded in 1990. They have two championships. Um, Ryu Jung the second is their manager. The NC Dinos we just mentioned they 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 are kind of one of the newer teams. They were established in 2011. They are in Changwon. They have zero championships so far. Their manager is Lee Dong Wook. The KT Wiz, which is a great name, established in 2013. They're in Suwon. Zero championships. Managers Lee Kang Chul. Uh, the Kia Tigers, which seem to be the uh, the most established team in this league, as they were established in 2001 and have 11 championships. They reside in Gwangju. Uh, their manager is Williams Matthew, which is a very... Uh, American sounding American name <laughs> randomly there. Then you have the Samsung Lions. They're right behind them. They were. It looks like the Samsung Lions are one of the oldest teams. It's them, the Dusan Bears, the Hanwha Eagles, and the Lot Giants. They are all established in 1982. Samsung Lions are in Daegu. Uh, eight championships. Managers Hugh Sam Young. Then you have the Hanwha Eagles, established in 1986. Franchises in Daejeon. Uh, they have one championship. Uh, managers Hong Han Wong Duke. The Lot Giants, established in 1982. Franchise in Busan, cha- two championships. Managers Her Mun Ho. So there you go. That, that's the 10 teams. Um, that's the 10 teams. Let's look at the schedule real quick. Who's going to. Here's a quick rundown. We might, we might do a Korean baseball rundown. Who knows? Uh, so here's a quick rundown. Uh, LG Twins beat Doosan Bears 8-2. to two. Uh, The Wyverns fall to the Hanwha Eagles 3-0. NC Dinos beat the, Lions, beat the Samsung Lions 4-0. Uh, the Lot Giants won 7-2 over the KT Wiz. And the Ki Woom won 11-2 against the Kia Tigers. So there you go. Uh, South Korean baseball, I mean, it is... I mean, people want baseball of some some sort, and we are getting it now. Uh, ESPN televising it is going to... Um, I've seen some footage of them televising it, and it's a very interesting way that they're televising. They're, they pretty much have... They have the... Uh, they have the... The commentators both sitting at home. They're both English-speaking commentators. They're both sitting at home, and they're just commentating... Th- a game from across the world at home. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. And it's going to, I mean, a lot of people have been trying to get into K, the KBO for the longest time. Cause it's legitimately one, one of the best leagues in the world. And, um, the atmosphere of the games, which you're not getting that atmosphere cause they're playing without fans, but the atmosphere of the South Korean baseball games is insane i've heard i would like it it's on the bucket list to go to a south korea baseball game go to a baseball a japanese baseball game i mean those games are insane they they do everything uh they do everything for the experience like they don't really care who wins or loses they do everything for the experience um but uh they don't they won't have fans so it's all on the baseball there so tonight wednesday night or Wednesday morning, I should say, at, 11, at 1 a.m. in the morning. Um, the defending Korea Series champion, Doosan Bears, will be against the LJ, LG Twins. And then the 11-time league champion, Kia Tigers, will take on the Lions on Friday. Um, so, yeah. Mark your calendars. So... Like we said, the first game aired at 1 a.m. Games will, re- will air regularly Tuesday through Friday at 5.30 a.m. So all you got to do is just wake up a little early. You don't have to stay up. Uh, Saturday will be at 4 a.m. And then Sunday will be at 1 a.m. 
uh, and all of these will be on ESPN two. So, uh, so tomorrow morning, all you gotta do is just wake up at five thirty, and then you can watch some baseball. Um, I'll probably watch reruns or highlights. I'm I I've been cherishing my sleep during this tough time and uh i'm going to probably stay that way but korean baseball i mean people are legitimately excited about it and i hope um maybe you're excited about it too i'm kind of excited about it it's just i can't i'm not that excited about it but anyways when we come back we'll be discussing andy dalton signing with the dallas cowboys You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco, ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project that's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. The NFL QB market is still going on. Believe it or not, we are through the draft. We are through most of free agency, but the NFL QB market is still hot like iron. We had Jameis Winston sign with the Saints. Uh, We still have Cam Newton out there saying he doesn't want to be a backup quarterback, which we'll probably discuss that at a later date. Um, And then the Bengals, who just got Joe Burrow, got the number one quarterback in the number one pick with the number one quarterback in the draft, uh, they are now moving on from Andy Dalton, the red rifle here. And what did Andy Dalton decide to do? He decided to go back home. He played for TCU. Uh, he went, he's going back home to the Dallas Fort Worth area to play for the Cowboys. Now, it opens a whole Pandora's box of questions because um, Andy Dalton is still a serviceable quarterback. There's a reason there's a Dalton, Andy Dalton line, which if you don't know what the Andy Dalton line is, that's basically the average mark <laughs> in the league because Andy Dalton's one of the most average quarterbacks in the league. Like, he's not bad, but he's not great. Um, he's serviceable. Um, pretty much where Alex Smith would be if Alex Smith was still playing. Um, yeah, so it's that Andy Dalton line that I've heard of many times before. So... Andy Dalton, he was released by the Cincinnati Bengals on 
Thursday. Speculation started to swirl. He's a three-time Pro Bowl quarterback. Will he sign with the Patriots and possibly becoming Tom ba- Tom Brady's heir apparent? Or would he f- join Jay Gruden, his former offensive coordinator down in Jacksonville, for uh, to join the Jaguars and uh, kind of you know shoo Gardner Minshew out the way? Um, but neither of those happened. Dalton is instead heading to Dallas. The former TCU star agreed to a one-year deal with the Cowboys on Saturday worth up to $7 million with a $3 million guarantee, according to a source. So Dalton is not being added to compete with Dak Prescott for the starting QB job. That is uh, that is what uh, the Cowboys are trying to say. Uh, but Prescott and the Cowboys have yet to agree on a long-term contract extension, and they use their franchise tag on Prescott in March, which we discussed that. Um, so they have until July 15th to work out a long-term deal. If they do not, the Cowboys expect Prescott to sign the tag, paying him roughly $31 million for the 2020 season. They then will plan to have them as their starter for a fifth consecutive season. Um, Jerry Jones said when they're ready to play, Dak Prescott will be there. Uh, so it's it seems uh, signing Andy Dalton as a backup is a great move because he he's going to be a great presence in the quarterback room. However, you kind of you're kind of telling Dak Prescott, "Hey, we need to get a deal done, or you're probably getting replaced." That's kind of how I'm reading into it. Um, Dak Prescott is legitimately a good quarterback. He had one of the best years. Um, he had one of his best years last year, even though the Cowboys kind of sucked, but. Uh, Dak Prescott is a legitimately good quarterback, and he kind of he deserves all the money he's asking for. I understand that they don't want to give him all that money because the Cowboys are looking to win a Super Bowl soon, and they've made a lot of great moves. They, the Cowboys had a great draft uh, and stuff like that. They still have they paid Ezekiel Elliott a lot of money, which is probably one of the other reasons they're kind of balking on this. Uh, but getting Andy Dalton kind of tells Prescott it's like, hey. We can replace you if you if you don't want to play ball. But uh, Jerry Jones said when we're ready to play, Dak Prescott will be there. So Andy Dalton, he already has a home in Dallas. He was the Bengals starter for the last nine seasons. Cincinnati made the playoffs five times during that stretch, falling in the wild card round each time. Never won an actual playoff game. Dalton, he is 32 years old. He has a career record of 70 61 and two as a starter he's completed 62 percent of his passes for 31,594 yards 204 touchdowns and 118 interceptions posting a career passing rating of 87.5 which is about dead in the middle (laughs) according to pro football reference dalton has orchestrated 20 comebacks and 24 game winning drives which is pretty solid Uh, he's also rushed 394 times for 1,221 yards and 22 touchdowns. So it was it was pretty clear last year that it was Dalton's last one in Cincinnati because Cincinnati was sucking. Uh, it wasn't necessarily Dalton's fault, but uh, Cincinnati was pretty bad. And then you had the emergence of, I mean, you had two already. Then you had the emergence of Joe Burrow uh, coming out and Joe Burrow being the Ohio kid. You, it's kind of a storyline you, you can't pass up uh the Bengals only won two games put them in the position for the number one pick um which they used on joe burrow so Dalton's role will be very different in dallas he becomes the first veteran quarterback with starting experience to join the team since mark sanchez in 2016 sanchez signed to be prescott's backup after tony romo injured his back in the preseason um I remember that happening. And then Tony Romo went on to be a very successful sports announcer. Um, So the Cowboys now have a crowded quarterback room. Cooper Rush, who got released, uh, he signed a a restricted free agent tender in March. Uh, He got released, though. They also drafted former James Madison quarterback Ben DiNucci in the seventh round, which they might, I guess they might keep around for development purposes, maybe as a practice squad guy and see if they can develop him into a good quarterback in, in case Dak leaves or Andy Dalton doesn't work out. But Mike McCarthy is the first year as Dallas' head coach. There was talk before the draft that the Cowboys adding a developmental quarterback like the Packers routinely did during his time in Green Bay. 
look for the Cowboys to now potentially keep three quarterbacks on their final roster. NFL rosters expanding to 55 players under the new collective bargaining agreement could make the plan more feasible. Um, McCarthy said last month, obviously we have great love for Dak, but if you go back to Ron Wolf in the early 90s and what was established in Green Bay, the ability to keep the most important position in football and develop that quarterback room, you can see the value not only it has for your football team if the starter is injured, but also the value it can bring to your team as younger quarterbacks move on. Um, so Mike McCarthy doing pretty much what he did in Green Bay. He's trying to fill his quarterback room with a developmental guy, a veteran presence, and, you know, your starting quarterback. Just, you know, in Green Bay, he had uh, two for one with Aaron Rodgers. But in Dalton, a loaded offense now has a proven starter as a backup in case anything happens to Prescott. Although Prescott has not missed a start in his 64 NFL games, he did injure his throwing shoulder in Week 15 last season on a QB keeper. Prescott struggled the following week, but he has never, he was never going to miss that game in Philadelphia with the division on the line. The quarterbacks, the Cowboys quarterbacks will have plenty to work with. Not only does Dallas continue having talented offensive line with standouts like Tyron Smith, Zach Martin, Leo Commons, Collins, uh, but it has one of the NFL's top running backs in Ezekiel Elliott and arguably the league's top receiving trio in four time pro bowler Amari Cooper, a thousand yard receiver Michael Gallup, and recent first round pick CD Lamb. So Cowboys looking to be one of the top offenses in 2020. Once again, so what does Dalton bring to the Cowboys? He gives the Cowboy, he gives the Cowboys an accomplished player to drive the car. If for some reason Prescott can't, it's a good backup plan. Hence, backup quarterback. Uh, the Cowboys have given their starting quarterback a contract offer that would make him among the highest paid players in the league. The number of years on the contract has been one of the holdups. Uh, the Cowboys would like a five-year deal, similar to what Cooper agreed to in March. Prescott and his camp are reportedly looking for four years, giving him a quicker opportunity to reach free agency and potentially make much more as the quarterback market continues to significantly increase by the year. Uh, Cowboys executive vice president Stephen Jones said last week that Dak's our guy. No one thinks that more of Dak Prescott than Jerry Jones and myself. I know Mike McCarthy, when he signed on to be the Cowboys head coach, part of why he signed on was Dak Prescott. It's just getting it done. The bigger these deals get, Jerry and I have always found that to be the case in business. The bigger the dollars get, the harder they get. We believe in our track record of getting players signed. I totally believe we'll get Dak signed at the right number. That's good for Dak, good for the Cowboys, good for this team. And he continues going on. And I think at the end of the day, the fact that we're getting some t nice hype for our draft, I think he's going to want to get in here and get with these players, whether it's CD Lamb or anyone else. He wants to win. We've said all along, the only one who benefits more than Dak Prescott, if the Cowboys happen to be fortunate enough to win a championship, is probably the Jones family. So we're all motivated. We're all motivated to win. We certainly want Dak to be happy but we also want to surround him with great football players. So Andy Dalton doesn't seem to be an issue here for the Cowboys. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a quarterback controversy or anything like that. So that's not something we have to worry about, but it, they're adding a nice veteran presence into that quarterback room, which will help. I mean, Dak Prescott is, he, he's, a, he's entering his fifth year in the league, uh, but having a nice veteran presence will always work out just another set of eyes for film and stuff like that when we come back we'll talk about another quarterback this time a quarterback with not a veteran and veteran uh aspect we'll talk about mitchell trubisky and the chicago bears what are they going to do for the quarterback position when we return you really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. 
and then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I'll, I'll go out and say it. I feel bad for Mitch Trubisky. I feel bad for him. Because his performance will always be compared to Patrick Mahomes and Sean Watson because he was drafted before either of those quarterbacks. I mean, it, it, imagine going through your life, going going through a career, and you you get you get um you get compared to pretty much a prodigy in Patrick Mahomes, who went won a Super Bowl, who just won a Super Bowl, and he he's been one of the most electric quarterbacks in the league for the past three years. Uh, then you you also get compared to Deshaun Watson, who, I mean, he was great all through college, and now he's he's pretty much single handedly carrying the Texans' offense. Um, and especially now without DeAndre Hopkins, he's going to be single handedly carrying that offense. Uh, you're compared to these two guys. Meanwhile, you're on the Chicago Bears. Um, yeah, you're just on the Chicago Bears. Now, I would like to reiterate, I don't think any, I don't think if the Bears drafted Patrick Mahomes, I don't think Patrick Mahomes becomes Patrick Mahomes. I would just like to throw that out there. I think Patrick Mahomes uh, is great because of Andy Reid, or he got developed by Andy Reid, and that's why he is doing so well right now. Deshaun Watson, I believe, can win anywhere. And that's just my opinion. That's my biased opinion as a Clemson grad. But uh, Deshaun Watson, he he can pretty much live, win anywhere, which is we're going to find out if that's true because we're we're dealing with Bill O'Brien over there in Houston. So, but Mitch Trubisky, uh, he he they did not pick up his fifth year option. They declined his option. So there's a huge question mark. They picked up Nick Foles. They drafted for. I mean, they traded for Nick Foles. Um, took on Nick Foles' contract, which means they're more than likely going to play him. But uh, the decision may have seemed like a no-brainer, but it still couldn't have been easy for the Bears general manager, Ryan Pace. The Bears are declining the fifth-year option of Mitchell Trubisky, a source confirmed, which means 2020 will be the last year of the quarterback's rookie contract. A fifth-year option would have cost the Bears $24.8 million for the 2021 season. It would have been guaranteed next March if Trubisky were on the roster at the start of the league year. It would also have been guaranteed in case of an injury, which means he couldn't pass if he couldn't pass a physical. The Bears would still be on the hook for the money. This That was deemed too costly a risk to take for a quarterback whose play dropped off so significantly last season that the Bears traded a fourth-round pick to acquire quarterback Nick Foles from Jacksonville. Since New Year's Eve, Pace has had five opportunities to answer questions about the fifth-year option, and each time he verbally kicked the can down the road, the can finally reached the end of that journey. 
Pace's reputation has been tied to Trubisky, the quarterback he traded up to take number two overall in 2017. The quarterback who went to a Pro Bowl following the 2018 season. The quarterback who took a step back in 2019. The quarterback Pace picked ahead of Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson. Which, like I said, that is just always going to be Mr. Trubisky. Unless he just uh, goes out and has has a Hall of Fame career for a different team or, or for the Bears. Like That is just always going to be his legacy. And I feel bad for him because that's such an unfair comparison but he did get drafted before those guys he they did trade up to get him number two overall he did make a pro bowl though but other than that i mean it, it's been just a disappointment uh since then the fifth year rookie contract option has not been the franchise's best friend in recent years it's been exercised for kyle long and leonard floyd long got a contract extension before his fifth season and floyd has, was just released before his fifth year salary was guaranteed. Kevin White pays his inaugural first round pick back in 2015 and exited via free agency after 2018. Trubisky can look to Kyle Fuller, though, for some motivation after Fuller missed an entire 2016 season with a mysterious knee injury and some seemingly lost confidence of defensive coordinator Vic Vangio. Uh, the Bears declined his fifth-year option. He entered 2017 on a roster bubble, then had a breakout season forcing the Bears to use the transition tag and eventually sign him to a deal to keep him from going to the Green Bay Packers. That earned Fuller big money, and he's lived up to it with a pair of Pro Bowl appearances. So maybe Trubisky can make do like that but few if any are expecting the same results from Trubisky the Bears traded a valuable pick for Foles and restructured his contract while Matt Nagy uh, said that Trubisky will get the first snap of practice whenever that is Foles has the familiarity with the coaching staff and more importantly the trust trust is very important but this is a new world for Trubisky who should be plenty motivated how he responds will impact who ultimately is the 2020 starter and then what it'll mean for 2021. With a lot of money at stake, here are six scenarios in honor of number six himself, Jay Cutler, for the Bears quarterback situation in 2020 and the possible results for next offseason. So we have six scenarios here. Scenario number one, Foles excels as a starter, hits his incentives to void the rest of his contract. So according to the Tribune's Brad Biggs, the final two years of Foles' contract would void if he plays at least half of the offensive plays in the regular season and postseason, and the Bears make the NFC Championship. Uh, it's not likely, but that's a possibility and represents the best case scenario for the Bears here. For Foles to get the team to the NFC title game, he would be a bargain with the base salaries in 2021-22 of $4 million. This clause would allow him to be a free agent, and the Bears would have no choice but to pay him starting quarterback money. That's a contract the franchise would gladly sign at that point if he leads them to an NFC championship, uh, but it would also lead to some tough decisions for players with high cap numbers in 2021, mainly on the defense. In this full saves the Bears scenario, Trubisky would exit via free agency, and Pace would have to search for a very cheap backup option, potentially via the draft. Scenario number two, Foles has a good year as the starter, but is unable to avoid the deal. There are other incentives that Foles can hit without needing to get the Bears to the conference championship. Per the Tribune report, Foles can earn $6 million annually in incentives for things like playing time, passer rating, making the playoffs, Pro Bowl, etc. Um, the bonus he gets would also be added to his base salary for the next year. Even if he hits those prerequisites, he'd still be a bargain for a quarterback, assuming he had an impressive enough season. The Bears would be fine continuing to keep him on this contract as they starter without having to worry about a new deal. Similar to scenario one, a more than confident Foles would lead to Trubisky's final days in Chicago and a new number two quarterback in town. If Foles is good, but maybe not great, it could impact where the Bears possibly target a quarterback in the 2021 draft. Scenario number three, Foles is only average on another Bears team led by its defense. And in my opinion, this is probably the most likely one. Uh, what happens if Foles is good enough to not lose his job, but isn't putting up the numbers that instills a ton of confidence in the future. In this case, Foles might not hit a lot of incentives, making his contract very affordable for a quarterback in 2021, but would Pace need to bring in veteran competition again or or with, or with go with an early draft pick? This type of season would challenge Nagy. Uh, how long would he stick with Foles if the team is still competitive thanks to the defense? It would make it easier for Foles to remain the starter, even if his play isn't inspiring. Either way, as long as he stays in that spot, Trubisky would enter free agency. 
Scenario number four, Trubisky wins the job and plays more as he did in 2018. Would you take 24 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, and a 95.4 passer rating? That's what Trubisky put up in 2018, a season that earned him a Pro Bowl alternate status. Let's say Trubisky actually wins the job or takes over for an injured or struggling Nick Foles and reminds the staff of what they saw in the 12-4 and season that it gave everyone such hope. Without the fifth-year option, the Bears would have a crucial decision to make as a free agent. Um, he would have some leverage, and the Bears might have some financial challenges with Foles' contract, which was $10.3 million in dead money in 2021. Uh, the franchise tag would come in play, and the Bears would once again be spending an exorbitant amount of money on a quarterback that they might not be sure that sure about, in addition to the money they would still owe to Foles. In this scenario, the Bears could still let Trubisky go to the highest bidder, stick with Foles, and pair him with the draft pick, and another veteran. Then, scenario number five, Trubisky wins the job, finally plays like a franchise quarterback, least likely in my opinion. It would take a miracle for this one to happen. Uh, along with the top defense and the best quarterback play the franchise has seen since Sid Luckman, the Bears return to the playoffs. Nagy's scheme is tailored better Trubisky. Uh, the, the offensive line ascends with a new coach, Juan Castillo. Uh, and the running game is revitalized. This would be a dream scenario for Pace and Trubisky, and the Bears could expose everyone's old takes. Uh, it's a very expensive scenario, although, because uh, without that fifth-year option, the Bears would have to use a franchise tag on Trubisky, and with Foles still on the books, they have more than $30 million of cap tied in quarterback. Uh, Trubisky's reps would have the leverage in contract talks, while Pace would have the tag. Would the Bears want to see one more good year before signing him to an extension? Um, and then number six. Which actually, number six is probably the second most likely scenario. Both play due to skill or injury, and neither appears to be the answer for 2021. So let's say Foles wins the job, struggles against bench, Trubisky relieves him, and doesn't save the day. The inverse of that is an option too. Foles starts the season, is okay, gets hurt, Trubisky takes over, is also okay, and the Bears are just mediocre. Um, pretty much any scenario that ends with the ends in Trubisky as the clear-cut starting quarterback sends him to free agent market to the free agent market. Foles' contract would keep him in town for the next year, knowing that he's a valuable veteran backup who's who be the perfect signal caller to mentor a rookie. Uh, that's something the Bears hope doesn't happen. I think that's the second most likely thing to happen. Um, so there you go. There's six scenarios that the Bears could be dealing with, with the Mitch Trubisky and the Nick Foles. The, it, it's crazy, and they're going to have to figure something out, and you're going to have to just let the play on the field decide what happens when we come back we'll talk about the nhl draft getting moved to june and how some nhl executives feel about that when we return are you looking for help for your fantasy football team check out the gsmc fantasy football podcast get today's best advice on who to start who to sit even who you should draft from sleeper picks to red hot lineups they got it all covered for you that's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast we'll cover traditional leagues dynasty ppr even idp leagues when you need fantasy help there's just one show to hit up don't forget to like them on facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. So the NHL, they currently postponed their NHL draft. Um, I don't remember when the draft was actually held, and I can't seem to find it um, at the moment. Uh, let's see, the 2018 draft was held in June. Um, so the NHL, they're trying to keep the draft in June, not move it. I, I made a mistake on my uh, lead-in at the end of the last segment. Um, so... Anyways, the NHL, they're trying to keep the draft in June, trying to keep everything status quo. Um, they postponed it a long time ago, and, and as the NHL season 
also got postponed and we haven't done the Stanley Cup playoffs yet. Uh, it's kind of weird that we're thinking about the draft, but they had a Monday call with the Board of Governors. They decided not to make a decision at all. The, the, the article I have in front of me right now is from May 2nd, so it's a little out of date, but we're still going to go through it because, I mean, it still goes through the minds of some people, uh, some executives and, and people like that in the NHL draft. Um, so, uh, in the polling of league's general managers to get their thoughts on conducting the NHL draft in June, the response was clear. They are not in favor, really, at all. Not at all. In the memo to the NHL sent to its teams on Friday, Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly Daly confirmed as much, writing that the majority of GMs prefer maintaining the current system a season and then a draft in whatever form that might look like. Um, I don't think any of the hockey guys like it early, said one GM on Friday of the June draft possibility. There's nothing that benefits us. Uh, that's a fair conclusion from a pure hockey operations position. But there's also the other side to consider. The league is in a position right now to lose a lot of money. The success of the NFL draft, one that included 37% increase in viewers on the first night, was certainly noticed. The league wants it to become, they want it because they want content, one source says, which makes complete sense. Uh, like I said, people are watching South Korean baseball because we are so starved. But however, I don't think the NHL draft will do as good numbers as the NFL draft, but hockey fans will definitely all flock to it just because it's hot. There's nothing else to talk about. So, uh, there you have that. I mean, the WNBA draft, they had a WNBA draft. They didn't, I mean, they did better numbers than they usually do, but, uh, people didn't really talk about it. In fact, uh, there was a huge controversy because Adam Schefter said, uh, for the NFL draft, it's like we have the first semblance of sports and a bunch of WNBA people got very angry at him. Uh, but, but I'm saying that because it's not guaranteed that you're going to have a huge increase like the NFL draft did. The NFL draft uh, is the biggest draft in sports. It might, uh, it, it's kind of the most interesting one. The NBA draft is second, but the NBA draft is really only interesting for like the first 10 picks and then it's done. The NFL draft, I think, is interesting throughout the whole thing because there's so many players on an NFL football team that uh, you have to pretty much look through the whole draft. Baseball draft sucks. Nobody likes the baseball draft. We don't talk about the MLB draft. Because uh, even even guys in the first round, they we don't know if they have a chance to even make it to the majors. That's what sucks about the MLB draft. Um, so uh, there's no guarantee that the NHL draft will make big numbers like the NFL draft did. Uh, I understand that... People are starved for content, and the NHL sees that as well. I mean, it's a smart decision to try to do it as soon as possible, try to get content, uh, but uh, it's the NHL. You're the fourth, maybe fifth most popular sport in America, so it's kind of it's kind of iffy on that one. But that was a portion of the argument laid out by Daly in his memo on Friday, but there were many others, and by the time the NHL's Board of Governors reconvenes on a Monday call, which they already did. Managers might either be resigned to the idea or at least somewhat more convinced that this makes sense. First, from a pure content slash entertainment point of view, this is a no-brainer. The league has already concluded that a traditional draft with fans and teams in an NHL arena isn't happening. It's not happening. No way. Now we're in the fall after a season wraps up. The most likely scenario right now concludes with a Stanley Cup being awarded early to mid-September, so either now or later. The 2020 NHL draft is going to be done virtually. According to the memo, the decision has been made already. So the NHL draft will be virtual no matter what happens. By holding it in June, the league believes that it has an extremely valuable opportunity not only to engage with diehard hockey fans who are eager for any morsel of news, but to attract new ones. It's significant that both NBC and Rogers, the league's national rights holders, are enthusiastically in favor of an early draft. Of course they are because they have nothing else to do. Um, Rogers has expressed to the league that June is the ideal window to provide major exposure to the draft coverage and also provides weeks of content leading up to the draft for fans tired of classic games and former players on Zoom. This has to be tempting. But the league also pointed out that this would provide teams with early access to his newest players at a time when fans are eager for actual hockey news. An early draft could help provide that the hockey media with several weeks of fresh stories and content, the memo suggested. Which is true. 
I mean, I, I, I'll talk about the NHL draft. <laughs> don't really have, don't really have a choice. I've been talking about the NFL. We're going to be talking about the NFL draft for like the next, the rest of the year, uh, until the NFL starts, if it does start. Um, so draft preview season certainly start immediately as would analysis and features on new players post draft. But one NHL team executive questioned the notion that the NHL draft alone could carry fan interest outside of the diehards, which is what I brought up earlier in this segment. For one, he pointed out that trades and roster construction drive just as much fan interest at the draft as prospects do. He's right. A June draft would be conducted without the traditional trades. Daly conceded, conceded as much in his memo and said that the league would have to put restrictions on the type of player assets teams could acquire or trade leading up to the June draft. But he also argued that this would create another window to focus on roster construction in the fall. So this draft would be all about the prospects that could actually prove challenging for attracting sports fans outside of diehard hockey fans, even if they are eager to watch something different than a Netflix series. Football is popular players known by fans in the U.S. because of college football, of course. So, uh, I mean, the NFL is just – football is the most popular sport in, in, in the uh, country. So, the NFL has the, has the advantage of having college football players. They have the advantage of having college football players who are already established in, in many different markets. Uh, they already have emotional connections with fans. So uh, fans of just those players, of those teams that the players play for, are going to watch the draft just to see their guy get drafted. Um, they're ready to drop in and play right away. Our kids are five years away and playing in places like Western Canada. People don't care. People Football is different. They know those guys. A lot of people watch college football. They know them. Uh, that's from a random executive. Uh, that's fair. It's all, it also might limit expectations on what an NHL draft audience might look like. The league's argument in favor went beyond creating content. Daily pointed out that getting prospects in the team system in June would preserve the traditional development cycles and ease concerns prospects have right now about their future. Teams would have the opportunity to share development plans over the summer and get them integrated into the organization well before the 2021 season. An early draft could be viewed as a tremendous positive for their mindset and psyche. There are still issues that need to be resolved, like, say, the draft order. The league's proposal for a June draft uses points percentages combined with the current playoff system to determine the lottery teams. The 15 teams that wouldn't qualify for the playoffs would be in the lottery. The final 16 picks would be slotted in inverse order of the regular season points percentage to make sure a bubble team doesn't make the playoffs when the season resumes and also win a June draft lottery daily proposed reverting to the previous draft lottery system in which just one lottery winner is selected and any lottery winning team could move up a maximum of four spots. That would be a nice win for Detroit and Ottawa with the Red Wings guaranteed a pick no worse than number two overall. If the system is implemented, the senators, because they own the sharks pick would land no worse than number three or number four picks overall. There's also an issue of conditional draft picks that remain unresolved. An analysis by the league found that there are roughly 15 trades with conditions tied to 2020 draft picks, and most have reasonable fixes that the league would rule on. Those solutions would be shared with the teams involved in those trades, and they'd be given seven days to either accept that solution or rework the trade to the agreement of both teams involved. Um, So overall, it's a compelling case. The league's conclusion is that they need a minimum of one month of preparation time to deal with the complexities of a virtual draft. So either way, we're going to know soon, which is a lie because they they met last they met yesterday and they decided that they'll make a decision next week. So we'll find out next week what they decide to do on the NHL draft, when to have it, and stuff like that. Um, having it in June makes a lot of sense on the content perspective, but from a team perspective, there's a lot of questions still need to be answered about the regular season and the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, draft order and, and conditional picks and such. Uh, so there's a lot of things that need to be discussed and they discussed them yesterday or they discussed some of them yesterday and they did not come up with a consensus. So we, we will find out next week about the NHL draft. When we return, could college football be headed to a season without some schools? We'll discuss that when we come back. Are 
Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. So, of course, we got to bring up college football as it is with well, college athletics in general as they are one of the bigger topics uh, of the COVID-19 ravaging the sports world here uh, as there's so many questions that still need to be answered about it. I mean, you have the the kids who played baseball and softball and you know, all the spring sports who barely started their season. Like, we, we had the conversations about whether or not they'll get eligibility back, which they, they will. Um but now we have an issue, another issue here, as uh, we have some states who are starting to open up. Whether or not that's a smart idea or not is up to you. But uh, there's some states opening up, and there's some states that mention that they refuse to have any gatherings, period, for possibly the rest of the year. So there are the. it's definitely a state-by-state state basis. Um, there's no real, like, overarching rule for all the states right now and that affects sports in general but college football specifically so COVID-19 first ravaged the sports world in the second week of March college athletic conferences generally acted separately but came to similar conclusions when they canceled their conference basketball tournaments since then the power five commissioners have held daily conference calls on all things coronavirus related including potential contingency plans should the football season not be able to start on time to this point, they've largely been a united front. But over the last couple of weeks, we've seen drastically different approaches from one region of the country to another when it comes to reopening businesses. In parts of the South and Midwest, diners are back at restaurants uh, and people are getting haircuts, while in the East and West Coast remain largely shut down. On April 24th, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp allowed bowling alleys, gyms, Tattoo parlors to reopen. Sidebar, why would you go to a bowling alley? <laughs> I'm just saying, bowling alleys and gyms are two of the places I would avoid the most during this right now. And I, I just, it's just, sorry, sorry. Anyways, that was a sidebar. Uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom is about to loosen restrictions for retail businesses, but only those that offer curbside pickup, which uh, I guess uh, they haven't had that because... Uh, uh, where I'm from, South Carolina, we've had curbside pickup. We like every place has curbside pickup, pretty much. But uh, across the country, neighboring states have formed coalitions to help their governments determine how best to move forward. A map of those coalitions wouldn't look much different than a map of college conferences from 40 years ago. All politics, as usual, are local. But college athletics is a national enterprise, and college realign realignment, conference realignment has created leagues that cover giant swaths of the country. The ACC stretches from Miami to Boston, the Big Ten from Nebraska to New Jersey. The American Athletic Conference includes both Pennsylvania and Texas. So what happens if similar disparities continue when it comes time for universities to officially decide whether they're in a position to welcome back students this fall, whether or not it's advisable to resume athletics? And one of those disparities exists not just from conference to conference, but even with league, within leagues themselves. It's only early May, and even the commissioners themselves aren't necessarily aligned in their answers. Pac-12 Commissioner Larry Scott oversees a conference spanning six states, four of which remain shut down. He said this, there's a spirit of cooperation when it comes to college football in particular, a strong bias towards making sure we do this together. We're all members of the college football playoff, and we're going to have a playoff at the end of the season. We need to have uniformity on how we have a season. Conversely, all six of the states in the Big 12 have partially reopened. Um, I think 
Commissioner Bob Bowlesby of the Big 12, Bowlesby, uh, great name for a commissioner, by the way. Uh, I think it will be very surprising if all of college football can start on time and play for this season without disruptions. Uh, even within leagues, there may be some situations where some of the teams will play and some of them wouldn't. ACC Commissioner John Swafford's conference encompasses uh, both COVID-19 ravaged New York with Syracuse and is in no position to fully reopen anytime soon. Uh, and then you have Clemson in South Carolina where downtown Greenville was hopping Monday, which that is true. I live near Greenville. It, it's it's actually very sad how many people were out and about. Uh, they opened the mall in Greenville last week. The mall. Anyways, uh, John Swafford said we're in 10 states. Theoretically, we could have half of our schools being allowed to play at a certain point and the other half not being allowed to play. Hopefully it won't turn out that way, but it could in any combination of play and not play. Then we would have to make some decisions as any conference would. The American Athletic Conference Commissioner Mike Arisco's 11-team league includes both Tulane, located in New Orleans, that is severe early outbreak, and then you have East Carolina, located in the county that's seen just two coronavirus deaths. We're going to have a, have a long discussion with our ADs about this, but the sense I'm getting is that we would play if the vast majority of our teams could play. Um, if maybe there was a team or two that couldn't, I don't think the teams that couldn't play would want to hold back the entire group, which he says that now, but when, when we actually get to it, it might be a little different. It, I, in my opinion, I think it depends whether or not if, if that team doesn't play, do they still get a share of the conference pie the earnings the money from it uh because then then they have an incentive to be safe about it and not play because that is the main issue with a lot of these um a lot of these collegiate especially college football decisions it's like there's so much money in college football we discussed it many times before college football mostly funds the entirety of athletic departments for some for most every school and uh so if you are Tulane if you are guaranteed to still get your piece of the conference percentage of TV revenue and money and stuff like that, would you play? I wouldn't. Just be play it safe. You're still going to get your money. Play it safe. But if you're not going to get that piece, then you're going to be forced to pretty much play. And, it, it, I mean, you're putting athletes in danger. You're putting athletes of the whole conference in danger, pretty much. But, uh, anyways, this could all lead to awkward college football playoff rankings. You have somebody that played eight games, someone else that's played four games. It's pretty tough to evaluate them against each other, Bowlesby said. As of now, all the leagues are preparing as if football will begin as scheduled for a few reasons. Uh, everyone wants to return to normal as quickly as possible, uh, quickly as quickly and as safely as possible. Uh, being prepared makes it easier to make adjustments if future events cause more delays. Everyone wants to be ready if the situation improves in the summer and allows for an on-time start. So SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey said, my focus has been on the preparation as is because then if you have to adjust, you'll be in a much better position. If you're prepared to go forward as scheduled, you can adjust from there as opposed to trying to prepare for adjustments and then coming back to an original date. But as the commissioners and their schools prepare for the best case scenario, there are two operative questions. What will individual conferences do if certain schools in a conference can't play because of conditions in conditions in their state or community at that time? What happens if one conference has so many programs out of commission that it can't play? The commissioners tread carefully around question number two, but Erisco uh, provided an answer to question number one above. Swafford said the discussions between the 7-7 seven, seven split and the 12-2 split would be fundamentally different, but he didn't go as far as Erisco. Uh, all the commissioners acknowledge the possibility, however, that some of their schools may not be in the same position as others. They hope that by the time they must make a decision regarding the season, these states will be more aligned. The NCAA controls the dates of the playing season in football, but it's important to remember that the schools are the NCAA. If a majority of them want to play in the fall and their state governments will allow games, either with or without spectators, then it's unlikely that the NCAA's board of governors would step in to force a delay. Another key question is when schools must decide whether they want to try to play games as scheduled. The NCAA Football Oversight Committee is expected to mandate a minimum of six weeks supervised training before athletes play their first games. That would mean a mid-July return to campuses, uh, which is about... 
Right. Uh, so when would schools have to okay that return? I don't know that there's a singular day. I think there's a range from the first part of July to the middle of July. That really is based on what I think is a consensus that having six weeks prior to an opening game is the best place to be. And though many school presidents and athletic directors remain publicly optimistic about the possibility of fans being allowed in the stands come September, Privately, many are playing for the looming possibility they won't be. The NBA is already considered delaying the start of next season to December in hopes that maybe fans are back in March, uh, said Adrian Wojnarowski. Uh, at this point, we know that we, you're going to take a huge hit financially if you don't have fans in the stands. The Power Five are going to take an even bigger hit. You've got stadiums that hold 100,000 fans, but the health and safety has been the primary concern, said Erisco. One of the arguments against having players play with no fans was if you can't ensure the fans safety how can you ensure the player safety the counter argument to that is that with players coaches staff event staff with the limited number of people who would be in the stadium without fans you can test them you can quarantine if you have to you can do things to protect them where you maybe can't do that if all the fans coming into your stadium there's so there's so many bad things that can happen if you get a hundred thousand people in the stands because i guarantee you at least one of those people might have it uh might have it might not feel the symptoms you know uh so that's a very dangerous um so yeah, I mean it's it's crazy. I mean college football could start with some teams and without some teams. Uh, it would be kind of crazy, and it would be interesting to see how they do the whole playoff system if that does in fact happen. But when we come back, we'll recap episodes five and six of the Last Dance. It is almost over. We have two more weeks. I hate it. <laughs> when we come back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. So night three of the last dance. We are we are we just finished episodes five and six on Sunday night. And, uh, it was an interesting, it was a great, great, another great pair of episodes. It went through a bunch of different topics. It went through the Dream Team. It went through, uh, Jordan's relationship with Nike. It went through, um, his gambling problems. It went through some of that drama. It, it had Kobe Bryant. It had Magic Johnson in it. And then it talked about, uh, the 92 finals. I th the 92-93 finals against Charles Barkley, which was, you know, you had a little Charles Barkley in there. Um, just what a, it was just an amazing, 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 amazing uh, two, two episodes, which a lot of people were worried uh, going into the, going into this whole documentary. It's like, will we actually talk about Michael Jordan's issues? Because the gambling thing is a huge thing. I mean, there, there's a huge rumor that he left the game after that third championship because he got in trouble for gambling. They just kind of secretly told him to go do something else for two years because he, I mean, that that's a real thing that people believe. And I kind of believe it too because, I mean, why wouldn't you believe? But, uh... Why wouldn't you believe that? Especially watching this. I mean, it was an issue. I mean, it was all over the news. Uh, you know, people were worried that he was betting on basketball games and, and gambling on his, his own games and stuff like that. Um, but anyways, I mean, we started off with, at the 1998 all-star game with, with the late Kobe Bryant, 19 year old Kobe Bryant, um, it talked about Jordan and Kobe's relationship. They showed a, a back, a back, a, a uh, locker room conversation Jordan had about Kobe, which was uh, crazy. Co uh, you had an emotional Kobe Bryant talking about how Jordan was his big brother, which, I mean, it, it leads to uh, Jordan's speech at Kobe Bryant's memorial, which he discussed that uh, he was like a little brother to me. I mean, it, that, that relationship was very real. I mean, um, so you get hit right away with with Kobe Bryant speaking 
and uh, you get hit right away with that. Um, then you move into the shoes. Do we have Jordan to thank for the sneaker culture? Probably. Uh, but he, he I mean, they told the story about him not wanting to go to Nike. He wanted to sign with Adidas, but his mom told him to go to Nike because, you know, why not? Just, just get hear him out. And he pretty much, I mean, Nike pretty much bet their whole company on, on Jordan. And and look where that that turned out. They they brought up Jordans. They brought up uh they brought up the Air Ones. They brought up the fact that he wore uh the Jordan Ones in Madison Square Garden in '98. Um, stuff like that. Uh, they talked about his contract that he signed with Nike. Um, visiting their campus. His his mom, like I said, his mom told him to get on the plane and go listen. Uh, he walked out with a quarter million dollar deal, which was a more than double the going rate for a big name athlete at the time for a shoe deal. Uh, he also guaranteed his own shoe line. Um, so uh, then after hearing you hear, then I love his agent just nonchalantly throwing out that he came up with the name Air Jordan <laughs> nonchalantly, like no, no fanfare or anything. It, it was kind of, um, but they had Nike has new Air Soul technology, and he was like Air Jordan, and then boom, Air Jordan, there it is. Um, then, then it went on to celebrities talking about shoes and the, the, how the shoes were to '90s kids, um, stuff like that, and how important that it was. Um, so both episodes zeroed in on the '92 and '93 seasons. We see Jordan find motivation as he, in a series of perceived slights, talk about the 92 finals versus the Portland Trailblazers where, where everybody was saying that he and Clyde Drexler were, were on the same playing field. Drexler was a slightly better three point shooter. And then you had Michael Jordan, uh, break the, uh, finals record for three pointers made in a finals game. And then he had the who me shrug each time turning to Magic Johnson. So that, that was an incredible story. And that, that kind of clicked in my head that, um, that kind of clicked in my head why Jordan has this legendary status, but it doesn't seem like LeBron does. It's because I think LeBron might be a little too nice. You know, LeBron does have his quarrels. I mean, you can see it with Steph Curry. You can definitely see it there, but I mean, they play, I mean, but you never really have, um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. You just never see stuff like this. Like, you never see anybody say, like, like no one, like, you didn't see LeBron go out and break the three-point record just because people said Steph Curry was a better three-point shooter than him. No, Steph Curry went out and did that because Steph Curry's a better three-point shooter than him. Uh, there's just not many moments where, like, people are challenging LeBron in a certain aspect of his game, and then he goes out and, like, proves him wrong, you know? Um Anyways, sorry to bring up LeBron in this. Uh, it, it's hard to talk about this without bringing that up. But anyways, then you go into the 93 finals against the Phoenix Suns, where Dan Majerle, I don't know how to say that, I'm sorry. I should know, but whatever. Uh, through no fault of his own, he he earned Jordan's scorn for the misfortune of being one of the Bulls GM, Jerry Krause's favorite players. He was tasked with guarding Michael Jordan and was routinely posterized. And then there's the Suns, Charles Barkley, the league's MVP that year, Jordan was a little upset. He says now that he didn't take that honor for the third year in a row. But with that, he said, okay, fine, you can have that, but I'm going to get this. This being his second straight NBA title. 92 Olympics, we talk about the Dream Team. Um, they talked about the Dream Team, about Isaiah Thomas's exclusion on the Dream Team, and uh, and how, I mean, it wasn't just Jordan. It was a lot of people on the team didn't want to play with him. So it kind of, it kind of quelled that, uh, that storyline that a lot of people thought that Michael Jordan was the reason he wasn't on the team. Then you also talk about Tony Cooch, Kukok, Kuk, Oh, Jesus Christ. Anyway, we talk about a humiliating Croatian, Croatian star who Jerry Krause was trying to lure to Chicago while Scotty Pippen's contract negotiations lagged. Um, so they destroyed him. <laughs> Um. Yeah, uh, and then uh, and then they talked about 
a, scr- a practice scrimmage they had for the Dream Team where Magic Johnson said, if you don't turn into Air Jordan, we're going to blow you out. Jordan's retort was, this is the 90s. He owns this decade. He took over the game running rough shot over everyone. Uh, and the bus ride home was quiet and Magic cracked. I guess we shouldn't have pissed that man off. Uh, stuff like that. And... Uh, you go into his political leanings where he didn't, he refused to endorse Harvey Gantt, a uh, Democrat running for Senate in his home state of North Carolina against a long serving arch conservative. Uh, he was racist also, Jesse Helms. Gantt would have been the first, state's first black senator, but Jordan, despite his own mother's pleas, wasn't comfortable speaking in favor of someone he didn't know. He donated to Gantt's campaign, but his engagement stopped there. An unfortunate quip made on the team bus. Republicans buy sneakers, too. Made him seem cold and mercenary. So the incident remained a stain on Jordan's reputation. Uh, Barack Obama gently registers the disappointment he felt in Jordan as a young fan. Though he seemed comfortable with his decision to steer clear of politics, never thought of myself as an activist, he said. I thought of myself as a basketball player that there was that's where my energy was it was never enough for everybody i know that i realized that so that scandal less saying power but more potency at the time however swirled around uh jordan's gambling habit in 91 jordan was called to testify in the drug and money laundering trial of a golf hustler whom he ridden a check for fifty seven thousand dollars good lord against that backdrop more against that backdrop more drama unfolded game two lost to the knicks in the 1993 eastern conference finals who reported jordan had been out in atlantic city the night before until 2 a.m around the same time another damning book was published michael and me are gambling addiction my cry for help it's author richard esquinez claimed Jordan owed him $1.2 million in gambling debts, which is just insane. League investigated and found no cause for concern, uh, but the story snowballed. Jordan did interview after interview where he repeatedly de- defended his behavior. Um, he said he could stop gambling, but he has a competition problem, which I could definitely see, honestly. Uh, but there, then the episode shows Jordan betting betting on holes of golf with friends, Jordan playing dice with United Center security, uh, throwing throwing coins, and then you, you got the the great uh, security guard with the perm uh, giving him the shrug and stuff like that. So I mean, this episode quelled a lot of a lot of suspicion about the whole last dance in general, because it is produced by Michael Jordan's production company. Uh, people were worried that they weren't going to get into the sensitive topics, but they did hear they did get into the sensitive topics in this episode. And I'm excited to see the rest of the series. We still, we have two more weeks of it. So can't wait for episode seven and eight on Sunday, but that is it for me today on Tuesday. I'll talk to you all on Thursday. Hope you all have a great, great week. Have a great Cinco de Mayo. Get some chips. Moe's delivers still, so do that. (laughs) See y'all Thursday. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.